Welcome everybody to the last session of uh, Audio Rama. Thanks for coming. Uh, we've saved the best till last. Uh, we've got arguably the most important man in electronic music here today with us. Uh, his production for Donna Summer, I Feel Love, was not arguably, but definitely the beginning of modern electronic dance music. Please welcome Giorgio Moroder. Bonjour. Siamo in Francia, no? We're in France. Are we? Um, really? Nobody told me. <laughs> okay. Ready. Good, good, good morning, Georgia. Good morning, good morning, or, everybody. Or is it okay if I call you God? C call me what? God. Well, how about virgin? <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we ask some questions? Yeah. T tell me about how you arrived in Munich. Well, at that, <clears throat> before Munich, I spent about three, four years in Berlin. That's where my, let's say, European uh, uh, career kind of started. I had some hits. Uh, actually, I was quite lucky because when I moved to, to Berlin, uh, first I was lucky to have an aunt there where I could stay. So I stayed there for several years. And I remember that I had my first German hit, uh, I think about three, four months after I decided to become a, 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 music, a composer, a song called uh, uh, Ich bringe alle Ketten, which, is, which was sang by an Italian, Lebanese guy, Ricky Shane. Then after like four years, I thought Berlin was, at that time, was really claustrophobic, you know, you, there was the wall, so you couldn't leave. I didn't have the money to take a plane, so, so I decided to move to Munich. I got a deal with a record company, and um, that's where I continued. And it was much closer to Italy, so I could go home much more often. Um, c can you tell me about, I mean, Munich was a, an unusual place at the time because it was a real uh, United Nations of musicians. There were musicians from, from Scandinavia, from France, from Italy, from the UK. Right. Uh, how, how did that happen, that there were so many different musicians? That well, at the time, there were, I, I think, two or three uh, musicals like Hair going on in Europe, so they needed some musicians, so there was... Uh, Thatcher, who was an English great uh, uh, keyboard player. There was uh, uh, Dave King, an American great bass player. Uh, Tor Balderson, who was uh, from Iceland, who then went back. Keith Forsey, uh, the drummer, was, uh, uh, he played in Germany with, a, with, an, with an English group, I forgot the name, and then stayed in, in Germany because the group didn't work out. So there were at, le at least <clears throat> six, seven great international musicians and some Germans, of course. And among other those um, expatriates, there was Donna Summer, who was, actually she was playing with, uh, I think, hair which closed, so she got married and she was basically living in Munich uh, without major jobs because there were no jobs. So Pete Bellotti, my co-producer, we found um, w one day we needed a um, singer or two singers with no accent, no German accent, because we did some demos for, for uh, an American um, group. And so she came to the studio and, you know, Donna, all happy and, and, and uh, enthusiastic. And so she sang beautiful, that little piece. But we noticed immediately that she had a great voice. So we told her, if we ever have a, a, a song or ever an idea, we call you. So uh, I, I think about two, three months later, we had our first song, which did okay, called The, called the Hostage. And then another one which did not do too well. And then one day, I told uh, Donna, uh, if you have an idea about a, um, a sexy song, really sexy, come in the studio and we work. So she came and said, oh, love to love you, oh, love to love you. I said, well, this is great. So at that time, I had a relatively famous studio in Munich, the, the Musicland, 
where we had uh, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Elton John, uh, Queen, Freddie Mercury. And that particular day, one of the groups was not playing, so I sneaked. It, it was in the, in the Arabella house, a big complex, and the studio was down in the, basically in, ba in the basement. And so the studio was a, 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 a available, so I said, let's try to do a demo. So we did a demo. Uh, two, three days later, we did the, the tracks. And uh, the idea was, let's do it as much erotic as we can. Let's try to, they, they can, everybody can say or they can say no. So I gave it to my publisher and the publisher brought it to Cannes for the festival, the Midem. I think it's still there now. Just about, it's hanging Just, on. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and she called me in the evening and she said, uh, everybody loves it, loves it. You can have a, you can sign her wherever you want now. And, and that was incredible. That was like, we thought there's no way that anybody would, would possibly be interested. And so Neil Bogart of uh, Casablanca uh, signed me or signed Donna and released it, released a single who did okay, but it wasn't a splash hit. But then one night he called me and said, you know, last night I had a, I had a, I don't, I forgot what he said, but something like a party. I, I had a dream. I had a dream of a sexy song and, and uh, I guess, the girl or the girls said, could you play it again? Could you play it again? So he was kind of tired. So he asked me if I wanted to, if I could, if I was willing to do a long version of it. And I did a 17 uh, minute version, which I think was the first one, one song, but a song with some, not just repetitive, I, I composed some new pieces, but it's one song. I think was one of the first uh, long playing actually, or extended playing. And that song, that song really made Donna and myself. Um, first it started in the discotheques in America, and I guess, like we are DJs, right? Some of us, right? And what, what's the best thing to do? You put the record on, 17 minutes, and you go out and have a cigarette, <laughs> and you could. So that's mainly the reason why this became a hit because everybody loved to play it, <laughs> and <laughs> and that was number one. That was a number one song everywhere, and I think it was one of the first songs, although it was so controversial. Uh, it was one of the first songs which came to, uh, was played in a radio in America. In America, they are very tight on, 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 on music. And thank God the BBC uh, blocked it at the beginning. But then I think later on they played it, they had to play it. Yeah. So that was, that BBC blocking it, that was a, a lot of promotion for the song. It, uh, I'm wondering what was the music that you were listening to that inspired the sound? Because it, it feels a, a lot like a Love Unlimited orchestra uh, production. It, it, were you listening to people like Barry White at the time, or? Yeah, I, I always liked Barry. I liked uh, the the the. Um, oh God, what what's that? Uh, the Philadelphia sound. I love it. Uh, the kind of strings they are using, and then a good friend of mine, uh, Michael Kunze, had that big hit with uh, the group. Uh, Is it Silver Convention? Silver Convention yeah. with Silver and and and. Uh, Fly, Robin Fly, which then became number one, uh, a German group number one in America, which is extraordinary. And um, we all used uh, similar sounds, you know, the, the, the keyboards, the, the, uh, especially the strings, zing, 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 that, which is basically inspired by some of the songs of, not Barry White, but the, the Philadelphia sounds. Um, you, you were interviewed in the New Musical Express in 1978, and, wh and when they asked you about making this song, you said that one of the things that inspired you to make the, the long version was uh, In a Gada de Vida by I Am Butterfly. Is that, is that true, or did you just make that up? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, when, when Neil asked me to do it, I did not know about uh, In a Gada de Vida. But then later on, somebody said, well, you may not 
be the first one, you may be the one of the first ones. And, and there was a long version of one song of, uh, in the Guerra La Vida. Right, so but, well, it wasn't an inspiration, it was a... No, no, I, I didn't know. I, I, somebody told me after, well, I was all happy thinking I was the absolutely first one, but then I was just the second one. Okay. Um, did, when did you set up your record label, Oasis? Did you, did you do that specifically to market your own productions? Or? Yeah, you know, as a young producer, you always try to get your own label, which means uh, now you're... You're a made man, you have your own label, which at the end doesn't mean anything. But uh, it, uh, it helped at the beginning. So the first th three productions I did were on, on, uh, um, on Oasis. Uh, Donna Summer, I did a song, an album, which was I thought was quite good, but didn't do well, called um, Einzelgänger. And there was a group produced by Pete Bellotti called Schloss. So those were the three songs we offered to Neil Bogart on the label, uh, the uh, Oasis. But then, then it just didn't work out. Plus we had problem with the name because there was a company, uh, a small, very small uh, label in America called uh, the Oasis. So I, I gave it up. I, actually it continued, but uh, not under my direction. With, with, it continued with uh, Casablanca. And did, did you build a personal relationship with Neil Bogart? He's obviously quite a legendary figure in American recording. Well, yes and no. The, the, at, at that time, I would be in America. I would be there with Donna. First of all, Donna moved to America. I moved, let's say, for a month or so. Then I went back. Then we recorded some of the... I think the second album was recorded in Munich with Donna. But so in the first years... I was in America for like two, three months. And Neil was, um, I didn't meet him that often because I, I didn't really have to meet him because um, uh, Pete Bellotti and I, we just did uh, the recordings the way we wanted. He didn't interfere at all. We would go there, okay, Neil, we have the 12 songs and these are the songs and, uh, and he was always happy. So Right. Um, how did you move from that kind of Philadelphia sound to using more electronic instrumentation? Well, I discovered for myself the, the, the MOG, the, the modular, in 71. Uh, I loved uh, the recording of uh, Walter Carlos called Switchy Dombach, where he, or now she, um, played all the instruments, the classical instruments like violins, oboes, uh, flutes, all that stuff with the synthesizer. And it came out so well that I thought I have to get to know this, this instrument. So I, I checked out where could I find one. And there, there was a German uh, classical composer, Eberhard Schöner, who had, who had one in Munich. So I went to see him and uh, he had a beautiful room in all quadraphonic, and he played me that uh, a composition of his. Uh, it was a bass line. You know, all those sounds you can do. And, and it, it, it was beautiful, but it didn't end. It was so long. It was at least a minute. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> the same thing. And, but I, I thought I need, I need to, to use this new instrument. So, I rented the, the, the Moog and I rented uh, uh, Bobby Wedel, who was the engineer, who was the only one actually at that time uh, who knew how to get any sound out of, of the Moog. It was like a, a, a nightmare, cables here, cables there. And, and so I would, I would rent him and I would rent <laughs> the synthesizer. And uh, when did you move from that to incorporating... I mean, I, I think the idea behind I Feel Love was deliberately to create a song that sounded like the future. Is, is that the case? Yeah, in 70, I think 77, um, I came up with the idea of doing an album with, with Donna with sound of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then I thought, what could be a sound which you could possibly call fu the future? 
And I thought the only way to do it is to use the machines. So I had the, 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 the morgue, uh, the modular, I had some other, I, had, I think I had a polyphonic um, synthesizer, one of, I, I, forgot I forgot which one. So I thought I could create all the sounds of, a, of an orchestra or, or of, a, of a group by using the synthesizer. So I had um, the bass line, then we produced a, a white noise, then with, with envelopes we cut it and we did a, the hi-hat, we did a snare, we did a, some other uh, percussive stuff. So everything, everything except the, the kick, which I was not able to get kick enough to, to make people dance. It's like, it has a beautiful low end, boom, 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 but not boom, boom. So we said, okay, Keith, the drummer, English, by the way, yeah. who, who did quite a job. He, I think he was there just with the, with the, with his the bass foot, drum. Like, yeah. doom, 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 for seven minutes. <laughs> so, but he did a great job. I never realized it was actually a live drummer. Well, it was a live drummer uh, mixed with the right. really big low end of, 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 the, of the synthesizer. And, and did the vocal come after the track, or did uh, Donna have the idea for the track? Before? No, uh, when, when, I started, when I started the song, I started with three notes. I told... Uh, uh, um, uh, his name. Um, anyway, I told the, the, the rented <laughs> engineer, give me a, a, a C, give me two C, dun, dun, a G and a B flat. So he got me dun, 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 those three, four notes. And I, I told him, put them on one key. And previously, I recorded a click. Uh, I think from a, from a Japanese uh, uh, drum machine. So by, by synchronizing the click which was on tape, the, the, the computer would play the exact same time as the click, mm. the time of the click. And I, I told him put the four notes on one key so I could play so I said, okay, now let's compose the song. I said, okay, let's do 16 bars, 16 bars of uh, the same chord. But uh, if you want to know the details, right? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm listening intently okay. here. So then the bass could work on major and minor chords. So I started with major chords. And then I remember, I remember Richard Strauss with, uh, with the beautiful song, Also Sprach uh, uh, Zarathustra, uh, where he has a, ma a minor and then becomes major, and it sounds so well. So I, I had the same. And so I did 16 bars with that, and then I guess four bars, uh, E flat. Uh, and so I built up the, the concept the chords of a song, not knowing, not knowing the melody, right? And uh, it turned out uh, at the end that it, it was uh, mixed. Uh, wasn't that great because uh, it, it was a little too, too numericals. And by singing, uh, we came up Don and I with a, with a, with a, uh, the melody. It was quite it was quite difficult to take, keep time because. Ooh, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. And, you know, if you listen, then it's easy, but if you have to sing it, you have to count. And then there are some sections where I still think now there are two bars too many. So one day I, I asked Don, how did you ever, how were you able to sing? Because it's so difficult, you know, you're there with it audience. So she said, well, she had her husband who, who was playing piano, I think, at the time, and he would count for her in the headphones. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, one, two, three, four, okay, go. <laughs> Otherwise, she, for, for whoever sings that song live, it's, it's really difficult. 
So that was... Uh, and uh, when you completed it, did it... Sorry? When, when you finished the production and delivered it, did you know that it was okay, revolutionary? Wait, wait. Did before you? that, I have to tell you another little thing. The original idea, the, the original sound was... Dun, 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 dun. Then when we started to mix, uh, the engineer, Jürgen Koppers, added a delay now suddenly it became doodle 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 doodle, which gave it a total different feel. So th that that was really the moment where, where the song took over. Yeah, I guess it gives it the swing. The swing, and then I made a little another major mistake. I had the original track on the left hand side bass on the left hand side, and on the right hand side I had the up like. Dun, dun, and if you if you hear it, it's great. But if you're in a disco, okay. So the first time I hear it in a discotheque, I was on the right hand side uh, of the of the stereo, and I was not able to dance because all I heard is what the up instead of the down. And since I'm not a great dancer, I was not able to dance. <laughs> So now, when I when I play it as a DJ, I put it, I make it much more mono. I put them much more together. So at least, at least I can dance a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so w were you aware when you completed it that, that it was something that was revolutionary? Uh, not really. I, I remember at the very beginning, uh, Neil Bogart was uh, he was interested, but not as uh, as much as I would have liked. Uh, and I think the song really started to to play well in England, and then then you know then I did a remix, not remix, re I mixed it again, slightly different, and uh, well, the the moment where I really thought it 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 could be something great is when Brian Eno told uh, David David Bowie in Berlin that uh, he said, uh, David, I found a, a record and I think this is the sound of the future. And you know, and, and coming from Brian Eno, that was like, -da, I had my, my- Your stamp of approval. Stamp of approval, yeah. That was, that was the moment I thought maybe he's right. Well, why do you think so many of the electronic pioneers came from Europe? There's a, a lot of the early electronic uh, producers and musicians, yeah. especially Germany. Obviously, there were many. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Michel Jarre in France. I, I don't really know. I know that I liked uh, um, uh, Switch It On Bach. That's why I got in. But uh, Kraftwerk, I guess, uh, I don't know. There was Kraftwerk, there was Michel Jarre, uh, Schulze. A tangerine Dream, a lot of Germans. I, I don't know why. Maybe maybe it's in the German f blood to have some more mechanical things. Because I guess. Is that maybe that's why they make good cars? Yes, especially. <laughs> uh, where are we? Uh, Audi, Audi. Yes. <laughs> Um, but but the, there was a feeling in the post-war period in Germany of kind of rejecting the the R and B traditions of America. When when a lot of the the crowd, what, what are now known as the Kraut rock groups, they were they were trying to create a new course for music in Germany. And I suppose that was a rejection of what had happened during the war and and trying to you build know, a, I, a new country. I personally don't go that deep. Um, what, I, <laughs> what I think is they, uh, uh, let's say, let's take Kraftwerk. They found this instrument, right? I, I, they must have heard it somewhere. So they said, wow, this is a great instrument. Why don't we do something? And, and I think that's how it, uh, it started. First of all, they, there was no singer with them. They all sang out, fun, fun, fun. Uh, so there was no singer, actually, who could do a, a, an, an album, a song with, with vocals. Uh, I don't know really how great they were as an instrumentalist because what they play is very easy. So I, I, I think they just started. And, and Michel Jarre, Jean-Michel Jarre 
had obviously a, 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 he, he's quite a good keyboard player, and and he had all those great sounds. So it's it's not only the Germans who did it. Jean Michel did, and uh, and but I think I think there was a possibility of doing something with a new instrument, and that's what they did. When you were making. Um songs like I Feel Love, did it, did it feel obvious to you that um, electronic music, not, I mean, you were obviously trying to convey the future by using electronic instruments. I'm wondering whether it felt inevitable that that's the direction in which popular music was going to go. Well, at the very beginning, I didn't think that I Feel Love would have that impact. But then, then months later, you hear the, not the same, but some especially the bass lines uh, uh, inspired. And, and, and I must say, it, it is quite difficult to have a, even an EDM uh, song where you don't have some kind of, of, uh, of uh, what's the word? Well, uh, I, I guess I, the, the DNA of I Feel Love is, is in so much in music. Some, yeah. Because without the, even even if you don't hear it, it's there, and it's. I think it's really difficult to not to use it at all. Right. Now, after you worked extensively with Donna, you you started to move into uh, soundtracks and composing soundtracks. Can you tell me about the the first one that you were commissioned to do and and what your experience was? What what's the difference between approaching a soundtrack and producing songs for a singer? Um, it happened that um, um, Alan Parker, the producer, the, 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 the director of Midnight Express, he asked me, he liked the song I Feel Love. So he called me and asked me if I was interested in doing a score and I was absolutely happy because I never did any and I, to be honest, I did not have a clue how to do it, but I said, yes, I'll do it. So he said um, the main thing he wants is a song which, which has that driving feel of I feel love. There is a scene at the beginning where the kid runs away, and uh, so that's when I composed uh, The Chase. And it, it worked very well. The, the guy is running and the music is, propels it. And the rest, um, basically, he said, do whatever you want. And so I said, oh, great. And, you know, I started all the sounds, which if I hear them now, I said, what did I do? <laughs> but <laughs> but, but it, it worked, especially towards the end, where the guy gets crazy and turns the, the, the mill. And the, it, it works really well. And it was... Uh, at that time, I think it was one of the first all synthesized score, and and I think it worked quite well. It was totally new for uh, for s not for the rest of the world, but especially for. Here, here's my copy, Georgia. Oh, good. <laughs> three three pounds forty nine from our price in oh. Marble Arch. Wow, oh, still, still still got the price still, sticker on it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. it, it, it works so well with the movie. I remember going to see the movie at the Empire in Leicester Square, and, and just which had a, a really great sound system, and uh, you really felt the power of, of the music, and, and the combination of the music and the visuals just really was quite stunning yeah. for the time. And, and it was so unusual, especially for Hollywood. They, nobody really thought uh, in, 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 in that kind of uh, uh, listening to a movie and, and having all those sounds. And, uh, and it was, I guess, for the Academy too, because they gave me, they gave me my first Oscar, so <laughs> it, I guess it was quite a good soundtrack. And uh, how long did it take you to do the soundtrack? How long did you work on it? Um, I don't really remember, but it was relatively fast, probably, probably two, three weeks. Because the, the song, the main, the, the chase came, that, that, that's a job of like two days. And the rest, uh, you know, you just start and, and uh, uh, it, it, I guess about three, four weeks. I know that then the, the, uh, Alan Parker came to Munich 
in Musicland, and we did, I think we did a whole mix in, in, a, in a day or so. Right. Because he was really concerned about the main theme. Oh, and I remember, I remember he was asking, uh, he said, you know what, this is all great, but here I kind of hear an oboe playing. So it was a Sunday, so I couldn't find an oboe player. So in one of the synthesizers, I put in oboe, and it was the oboe. It sounded a little bit like a, a, an oboe. But if you tell somebody this is an oboe, then, then they believe it. <laughs> and obviously, uh, getting an Oscar for your first soundtrack meant that you were offered very many soundtracks after that. I'm wondering, uh, out of all the ones you've done, which is, which is the one that you're most proud of? Um, well, uh, at the end, at the very end, uh, well, I did my, there are three. One is uh, 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 Flash Dance, where I did the music and the songs. Uh, American Gigolo with Call Me. But then the, the, the soundtrack, which as a soundtrack did most, most impact was, was Scarface. Right. Which did not do, the movie did not do too well at the beginning. But then the, then the video came out, and the video was a huge success. But um, Flashdance is a genuinely a dreadful film, isn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never seen a more unlikely welder in my life. <laughs> but wasn't she beautiful? I, she was beautiful, but in my experience, welders don't generally look like that. And not, they, they don't have the long hair. No, and, and they're usually bald. <laughs> and ugly. <laughs> But you know the the the, the story with with um, with uh, Flashdance, I did not really want to do it when Jerry Brockheimer asked me because nobody really knew what what does Flashdance mean? Is it something slightly uh, rude? Rude tone, and so I said, okay, I, I'm not going to commit. But uh, um, you play me the play, give me the, the, the uh, uh, not the final, but the good uh, rendering of the movie, and then I decide. So she, he gave me a tape. I went to a studio, and my, my girlfriend of that time was in the living room listening, watching to the movie, and I came out, and I see her crying. She said, Oh, what a great movie. Oh, it's so romantic. Oh, I said, I definitely have to watch it too. And that's when I decided to do the music. Fantastic. So it's, women loved it. Maybe that's what I'm missing out on here. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you look like the sort of man that's traveled on Concorde a few times. And what? Uh, you look like the sort of person that's flown with Concorde. A few times. I, I don't tell you how many times. Okay. Have you got any funny Concord stories you can tell us? No, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, one. Uh, I flew the first Concord with Pete Bellotti. Uh, before they flew New York, they would fly London, Washington, and then and that was, that was it. So we say, okay, let's fly first time. And you know, you fly, you get caviar and, and champagne, and it was wonderful. And we arrived three hours and 26 minutes later. And so, okay, and then, and now we take the plane from Washington to New York, because we wanted to be in New York. And so we took a company which is long gone called Braniff. And there we were sitting like this. We got for, 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 for to f food one little cracker. Uh, can we have a, a, a glass of water? Well, you have to pay. So <laughs> from being in, the, in that luxury <laughs> Concorde, we came in, in the, and said, well, this is reality. The Concorde is not reality. Um, you, you've recently become the world's oldest DJ. Um, can, can you tell us how you, how you uh, became a DJ? I mean, I think you did actually DJ in the early 70s, didn't you, before? N n no, actually, yeah, yeah, late 60s, but that was not not really DJ. I, I, would, I would sing four, five, six songs on tape, and I would take 
some records, 45s, and I would play them, but not, it's, well, it's kind not of Not the same as today. No, no, no. So, no. so tell me about your entry into the DJ the entry, market. As, as so often in life, came as a little bit of coincidence. I had a, a good friend of mine, an Italian guy in, uh, in uh, Paris, who, worked for, who works for uh, uh, Louis Vuitton, and he asked me, oh, actually, he and, and, uh, and um, what's his name? Kim and Kim Jones. Who, who just got an award with me in London a few weeks ago, right? He asked me if I could do a 12, 15 minute DJ for one of his shows. So I did that in Paris and it was, it was a nice hit, people applauded and, but at the same, the same day, uh, they asked me if I wanted to do a DJ uh, gig with, for Elton John's Anfar, you know, the AIDS uh, benefit in Cannes. Yeah. And, I must say, it was an hour DJ, and I wasn't, not, I wasn't really prepared. I had a friend of mine who was helping me out, and it was a disaster. It was this beautiful L'Hotel du Cap, Cap, L'Hotel du Cap, and uh, they had dinner, and then they would come down to the, 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 other, the other place there, and we would play, and I was trying to make them dance, and nobody would not dance. And, you know, it was, sorry to say, but it was Hollywood. Like all uh, uh, drinking and talking about what's your latest movie, and they couldn't care less about me playing. And there, and there were quite a lot of famous people there, weren't there, to, to watch your disastrous oh, debut diploma? A lot, but I guess they, they didn't probably even notice me, so the damage in Hollywood was not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Then, but at the same, that same evening, I got an offer to do, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the, the, the Red Bull Music Academy, and they said, why don't you come to, to New York and teach for an hour Q&A? And uh, I said, well, you know, just to come there for an hour, uh, and I, I cannot charge you for that, but couldn't we do something so I don't know who, but somebody came up with the idea, okay, let's do a DJing. So they went, uh, they organized it at Cielo. You know that? Yeah, yeah, that I know it well in Manhattan. And after a week, they said, no, no, Cielo is too small. Let's go to Brooklyn to the... Output. Output. And that was a huge success. Oh, that was absolutely fantastic. And since then, I'm traveling the world. Amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, I, 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 thank you. <laughs> and, and we have so many DJs here, so you know all the, all the problems and all the, the, the great things about, right? The travel, travel is actually the worst, right? Traveling, to, you know, if, uh, I remember that my, my, my shortest or longest was, Los Angeles, uh, uh, China, in, in Shanghai. I, was, I came in in the evening, I performed at two o'clock in the afternoon, okay. and I left the day after back to LA. So I had jet lag, jet lag, mm. which <laughs> at the end... It, was... it, it can be tough. I'm, uh, I'm gonna ask you one last question before we open up the floor for other people to ask you some questions. Um, what, what do you think has been the most important um, piece of technology for you in your career in terms of, you know, either a, a drum machine or a keyboard or, or a, a, a mixing board or whatever? What, what's the one that uh, you think has helped define your, your career and your sound? Well, I, I, would say, I would say two. One is when Roger Lynn came from San Francisco to Los Angeles and said, Giorgio, I, I invented a drum machine. It, it's, it's called the Lin machine. And he showed me this beautiful looking machine and you could do it, it's, it was analog, so you could do all the, the, the sounds, uh, you could play it by hand actually. That was one and um, I overused that sound for, for too many for too many productions because you know once you find a great snare once you find a great kick 
you use it over and over and there was a problem. It was, it was very popular with Prince as well. He, he used it all the way through yeah. the 80s. And so now I, I, if, if I hear some stuff which even, even in 85, 86, for example, Take My Breath Away still has that sound. Yeah. I should have used uh, live uh, drums. But obviously the main instrument was the, the Moog, the synthesizer that uh, defined, I started in 71. I had a, a hit with a song called Son of My Father, where I was one of the first, apart from Emerson, Lake and Palmer, to use it as a solo. And then Chicory Tip in England did a cover and became number one. And, uh, and, but my, uh, my song came out in America and went to number top 40, so there was a little bit of a revenge. But so the, the synthesizer is definitely the, the, the main instrument which, I, which helped me and I love to use. Great. Um, right, I'm sure there must be some questions that you guys would like to ask. Anybody want to ask a question? Hello, Mr. Moroda. Hello. I, I come from Munich. Oh, good, good. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan and a little producer. <laughs> and I was uh, reading about uh, you, not about only about the disco area, but before when you were making German Schlager pop music, also later, that you were a very uh, strategical composer, that you were analyzing the hits of the moment or music of other people quite um, well and trying to adapt the schemas or the ideas of the moment that had a success and turned it into new songs. Is that right? You know what? I don't think that's that right because if that was right, I would have produced better songs. <laughs> <laughs> especially especially in, in Germany. Uh, uh, I did some good songs, but I did so many bad ones. <laughs> in, in, in fact, uh, uh, I just saw an album uh, came out uh, a few years ago with a compilation of my very first song to, up to almost the last one, and it's so bad. The, the beginning, the, I mean, uh, I had, uh, I, I was in, into, into bubblegum, I loved it, so I, that's what I did. And I had one song which is exactly for more than 40 years old, and it's on that album. And two years ago, the, the company who owns Audi, Volkswagen, right? They own it, right? I have no I, idea. I think so. Anyway, they asked me if I could uh, re-record a song called Dooby Dooby Doom, Dooby 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 Doo. And I said, no way, but then said, wait, look, we, we want that song for the big commercial of the, uh, the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. And you know, the commercial on Super Bowl is the non plus ultra. It's like, I don't know how much, that's like four million per half a minute. And that old song, which I completely forgot, made me a ton of money. I cannot even <laughs> tell you how much. So I was happy that I produced that song in Munich, or no, actually in Berlin, uh, 40 years ago. It's true, actually. There's a couple of sacks of money behind here that he's going to take with him. <laughs> uh, right, anybody else want to ask a question? So I put a second one? Go ahead. Is it true when you closed Musicland Studios that it was the reason was because they built it the the underground line, and you couldn't go on to record music? No, well, it's a little different. Uh, when, I, when I moved to the States, I said, I don't need music land. So I sold it to my engineer, who then became famous, Mac, who produced uh, Freddie Mercury, Queen, uh, a lot of, and then he became famous. So he moved to America. So he sold it, no, he didn't sell it. He gave it to the engineer at the time, and it, then it faded out. It just the the I I don't know if it's the the, the freeway the, the subway or if the studio just didn't work anymore. But um, 
I don't think it was the, the I don't think it was the, the, the subway. I remember we got a plan of the of the the studio and and somebody made a kind of a line and said this is where the subway is going to pass. But but uh, I don't know if I, I personally think it was more like the studio just didn't work anymore. And Maki was a Maki was away, I was away so and then, and then the, the English law changed. So you know, we had all those Rolling Stones and all those guys, and basically they used uh, Musicland because they had to record outside. Uh, it was tax uh, reasons. Tax yeah. reasons. And that changed too, so they didn't have to go outside. Right. Um, Sam, you want to ask a question? Um, I, I love your soundtrack work. Hello, here at the back. Um, I love your soundtracks. Um, are there any modern film composers that you admire? Uh, well, the one I admire the most is obviously um, Help Me Guapa. Um, <laughs> the guy who worked for, for, for all Spielberg's movies. Uh, John Williams? John Williams. John Williams is incredible. But the other guy is, is Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Hans... Uh, in, he didn't invent, but he in, he has this huge sounds and 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 uh, he comes up with ideas. For example, for one of the movies he did uh, not too long ago, he created a new drum sound. So he had about 10, 15 people, all with different sounds and a microphone in the middle, and they created that sound. So he is he is really looking looking for new sounds i worked with him on the on the so, on the on the song for uh, the academy award about three years ago and um, he's incredible incredible very talented uh, found a great sound and and it, it it works in almost every movie and for example the no, forget it, I forgot, the, the, <laughs> I forgot the name. Hans Zimmer also made the first British house record as well, incidentally, before he went on to make soundtrack records. Um, d does anybody want that? No. Hello, Giorgio. Te lo dico in italiano, poi lo dico in inglese. Quante ore spendevi in studio per registrare, tipo Fuga di Mezzanotte? Quanto stavi in studio, lavoravi di notte? How many hours uh, you spend uh, in the studio for recording? Oh, the, the, it's uh, at the very uh, at the very beginning in Munich. I would spend a lot of time, like twelve hours a day at least. Uh, maybe starting starting midday and then working until midnight, one, two, three. Then uh, later on a little less, but eight, nine hours. And I, I remember in eighty seven. 86, when I did um, uh, uh, Top Gun, I, I, had, I worked all year. I, I had two weeks off in a, in a year. And, and there I, I programmed my life, my work life quite well. I would start around 11, 12 o'clock until 7, 8. And then I went for dinner and I went home. So I had my, my guys finishing at night and I came back in the morning. So that was, I organized my life quite well then. Qual era il momento migliore della giornata dove eri più ispirato, se verso il pomeriggio, verso la notte, perché ci sono The best time to, for me to work is during the day. Um, you know, like maybe just starting in the early afternoon, uh, you know, once once you get into into t 10, 11 o'clock, uh, I think you lose a little bit. Uh, but sometimes you have to. Sometimes, you know, the the difference between between songs for groups and movies is with songs. If you're a week later, usually you don't have a problem. But with movies, you have to deliver, and there is no way. Uh, the 31st of that day, at that hour, you have to deliver. So it's much tougher, and, and that's why with, with Top Gun, I, I, I worked so hard. Uh, next question. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm so curious. Okay. 
Uh, what is your opinion about the sample culture? There's songs of you, uh, some concrete ones that maybe I should not mention, but that have been sampled by people who sold a lot of records. Do you know what? I'm not really following that much if people sample. I, you know, I don't really care if uh, if somebody if somebody likes it. Uh, uh, it's okay with me. I, I think now, but I, I don't really know, I think they pay now. It's not like uh, 10 years ago, they would just sample, sample and not pay. I think they pay now because it's, everybody's checking now, is, is this a sample or is it not? And I love one of the samples uh, which, uh, which uh, um, Kanye West used in one of the songs, The Mercy which he did a, a very nice little trick. He used uh, partially uh, just chords from, from Scarface, but slightly different than I had, the, the sequence. He, he changed the order. He changed the order, but you know him immediately. I, of course, this is that piece. So I'm, I'm, I'm not like uh, Keith Richard, who says, whoever, uh, why don't, why don't everybody f uh, compose their own song and don't sample ours? It's a bit rich given how much music the Rolling Stones have stolen and put oh. their names on, really. So, <laughs> uh, for, to my mind, they sampling is a, is a continuation of what we've always done in pop yeah. music, which is steal other people's ideas. Yeah. But, but, you know, the, the difference is if you steal a recording or if you steal a melody. Like, if you steal a recording, that's, that's a little tougher, right? Like physically yeah if they if they inspire uh, you in, in, inspire inspire there's one song with madonna where where it is doodle, 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 doodle. no no what is this yeah she changed she changed one note and and that is a little bit of a, a lot of inspiration yeah <laughs> That, that's verging on piss taking. Yeah. <laughs> but but so I'm I'm reading, you know I get all the 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 uh, the, the Google alarm uh, alert to what's coming out and and uh, there are so many uh, articles articles which says, okay this song here has the sound of Giorgio here and this and and sometimes I really listen to those songs, and I said how did that reviewer ever think this was a, a piece sampled from, or they have much better ear than I. <laughs> I don't know why, but a, a lot of that stuff is, you know, the writer just thinks, okay, there's a little bit of marauder here, and, and, but I, usually I don't hear it. No, there's probably a little bit of marauder everywhere. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it would be nice if there would money be ever <laughs> coming in from everywhere too. We, we've got time for one more question, Jason. Hello, Jojo. I was wondering if you would have any advice for musicians today who want to pursue film scoring or to transition into film scoring. Oh, I, I, th I think it's a great time now for musicians. When I when I started, uh, 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 there was obviously much much less competition, but you needed a certain amount of, you have to play, you have to have a certain amount to record a song. Because uh, uh, even if you have friends who start with you, but un, uh, without uh, one, two, three thousand dollars, it's difficult to, to, to do a record. And I didn't have the money. I, I was lucky to have the first song. Somebody produced it and, and I was able to get in. Now it's like, it's almost a dream you have you have with two thousand dollars. You have a digital studio complete with the best microphone, the best sounds. Uh, it's all one package. You can take it with you, go on a vacation, and work. And then, and then, if you're little, know and you can learn how to use the the, the social media, you you can sell. You you can have a career just out of that. Just, uh, Justin Bieber started as a putting his songs on, on YouTube and a lot of people. So I, I think the possibilities now are, are quite good. Thank you. 
Um, I think that's all we've got time for, actually. So can everyone give a big round of applause oh, for Giorgio? Great. Thank you, thank you. And I, I must say you were a great, great audience, almost as good as the audience when I DJ, although they dance a little more than you. <laughs> And thank you. Great interview. Thanks, Giorgio. Pleasure. Okay.